When I met my husband, it was a whirlwind romance. He was rich and charming and had always gotten whatever he wanted. I was thrilled and a little surprised that he wanted me. It wasn't until years later that I learned what he wanted wasn't really me at all. Anyone would have done. He wanted a trophy wife, someone that would make him look good on his arm, someone who could make a good impression on his stuffy lawyer partners and friends. At first, we were blissfully happy. Life being rich was very different for me. I didn't come from a poor family by any means, but we were far from rich. We were middle class, lived in a small bungalow, and both my parents were teachers. They were good with their money and had been able to send both me and my brother to college, something I was forever grateful for. My parents liked Bren enough, but they felt out of place in his world. His parents were friendly, but snooty, and my parents were all about the working class and helping out. Snooty was not something they understood or wanted to be around. Brett and I lived in a mansion, an actual mansion. We had a cook, a cleaner, and a gardener. It took me a long time to get used to all the people around the house, and it took me years before I was comfortable to even ask them to do stuff for me. I think that's why we got along so well and they liked me so much. They had never worked for a rich couple where the lady of the house wasn't a complete snob that bossed them around. Much to my husband's distaste, I would play cards with the staff, have drinks with them, given them time off whenever they needed it, and buy them gifts for their birthdays and Christmas. Brent always said that they were paid perfectly adequately and didn't need all the extras I would give them. But I didn't see it that way at all. As much as it bothered me to have servants, I figured I could make their lives better in some way, that it would be good for everyone and could make the whole system more tolerable for me. The head cleaner Mary was a middle-aged lady who'd lived a hard life. She had struggled from the time she was young and had to look after her siblings when her parents were killed young in a car accident. Mary had asked me if she could book some private time to talk with me away from the house. I could tell by the look on her face that she had something important to discuss with me. We met at a coffee shop around the corner the next morning before her shift started at the house. Mary was struggling to come up with the words and was having a hard time looking me in the eyes from across the table. I reached across and took her hand. I said, Mary, haven't I always been kind to you? I consider you a genuine friend, and you can tell me anything. If you're worried about me telling Brent, don't worry. You can trust me with anything. Mary said, I've been unsure as how to handle this for quite some time. The golden rule of housekeepers is to not get involved, but that's just it. You've always been so nice to me. I feel I can't turn a blind eye. She was trying to keep the tears from overflowing and started to tell me a whole lot of things I didn't know about my perfect husband. Apparently, Mary had overheard conversations between him and multiple other women. It looked like he was cheating on me and had been for a long time. I was shocked, but couldn't really say I was surprised. She told me that there was something else, something much worse that she had to tell me. Mary had been cleaning Brent's office one day when she stumbled upon some documents that she thought had fallen behind a bookcase. After reading them, she realized that they were hidden there on purpose. There was a wedding picture of Brent and his first wife. I didn't even know he had been married before me. There was an insurance policy and a death certificate. The death certificate was for the wife, who had died accidentally when the gas stove had been left on overnight, killing her in her sleep. Brent was conveniently away on a business trip at the time. What Mary was most upset about was a recent conversation she had overheard about upgrading the life insurance policy he had taken out on me. She said she feared for my life and knew he was up to no good. I always knew he was bad, ma'am, and that's why it took me so long to get comfortable with you. I assumed you were like him until I got to know you. I sat silently listening to every word she said. I was shocked, but I trusted Mary completely. I knew what she was risking by telling me all this. I decided I would go do some digging of my own and try not to panic until I had proof. 
I wasn't sure if it was in my head because of paranoia, but I could swear Brent was extra nice to me that night when he came home. He talked about going on a boat trip, just him and I, and I so desperately wanted to believe him. I couldn't help but think how many accidents could easily happen on a boat trip. The next day after Brent left for work, I pulled out that bookcase and looked at the documents. Brent's first wife was young, beautiful, and smiling from ear to ear. Just the fact alone that no one had told me about her was a big red flag to me. Obviously, this was something the whole family had buried. The woman's name was Margot Timmons, and there was an address listed for her that wasn't too far away. I decided that I would go check it out. It was only 10 minutes away and was a huge palatial home. Just Brent's taste too, I couldn't help but notice. An old withered woman answered the door. When I asked if she knew a Margot Timmons, she burst into tears. Turns out it was her mother. She invited me in and told me in no uncertain terms that her daughter had been murdered by her horrible husband so he could cash out her insurance policy. The puzzle pieces were starting to fall into place and I realized I had to get away fast. I also knew that he would never grant me a divorce and that he had the means and the power to find me anywhere I went. It seemed extreme, but I knew the only way I could get out of this situation would be if Brent thought I was dead, having no reason to come find me. That way, I could start over with a new name somewhere far, far away. Mary said she would help me, and my plan was for her to come join me when things were settled. Mary's son was a doctor, so she was able to get some powerful sleeping pills that actually slowed the body down to the point that no pulse showed registered, and it would look like I was dead. The coma lasted for a week, which would be enough time to go through a funeral, so Brett would really think I was dead. When in the coffin waiting for burial, Mary was going to come and rescue me, put weights in the coffin, and we would escape into the night. My plan was to take the pills, leave a suicide note, and time it so Brent would find me. The plan went perfectly. I took the pills, Brent found me, and a quick funeral was scheduled. I knew Brent would want to keep it as quick and quiet as possible, so as not to sully the family name. He had spread some stupid story about how I had decided to travel overseas for a while, and then I imagined he would spread the news of my accidental death somehow. There was, however, one fatal flaw in our plan. I didn't wake up when I was supposed to. And Mary wasn't there to pull me out of the coffin before I was buried. When I did wake up, I had been buried alive. I clawed and scratched and screamed as much as my weakened body would allow. I knew I was running out of air and was starting to panic when I heard a sound overhead. It was Mary and the gardener digging me out. They pulled me out. And Mary sobbed and told me how sorry she was. Brent had been acting suspiciously towards her and was watching her every move. She just wasn't able to get away any sooner and didn't trust anyone else enough to come. I told her it was okay and that we had made it. We put the weights in the coffin, covered it again with earth, and headed straight for the airport with our fake passports and IDs, with our new identities. Life started afresh with Mary by my side, where she remained until her death as an old woman. My life was finally authentic. I had met a good man, a teacher like my dad, and we had just had our first child. I barely thought about Brent and the life I left behind, but I often worried for who he found next. To watch more animated story videos like this, hit that subscribe button. And tell us in the comments section what you thought about this story.